Welcome to Utilizing Tech, the podcast about emerging technology from Gestalt IT. This season of Utilizing Tech focuses on edge computing, which demands a new approach to compute, storage, networking, and more. I'm your host, Stephen Foskett, organizer of Tech Field Day and publisher of Gestalt IT. Joining me today as my co-host is Mr. Alistair Cook. Welcome to the show, Al. Thanks, Stephen. It's good to be back on the show again. Uh, I'm an IT uh, analyst and uh, now an IT hands-on engineer, as well as writing about this this technology for a while. And um, Stephen, we're going to head straight into talking about my fellow countryman. I believe uh, you'll introduce him now. You're absolutely right, Alistair. Uh, joining us is a fellow Edge Field Day delegate, Mr. Ben Young. Welcome, Ben. Good morning. How are we all going? Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So we, uh, you know, you guys got talking last time at Edge Field Day uh, about how this whole world has changed so much. You have a lot of experience in um, uh, an area of edge that we've uh, kind of hinted at, but I don't think we've talked too much about, and that is agriculture. Ben, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was. It's funny. Uh, earlier in the year, me and Alistair got talking uh, offline at um, Edge Field Day, and it turned out that around the same time, sort of fifteen odd years ago, we were both working for an agricultural company in New Zealand. Um, different ones. We've got two main fertilizer companies here in New Zealand, and um, I was working for one, and, and Alistair was working for the other. And these businesses, you would think, would be relatively simple, given they make fertilizer and farmers put them on the paddock, but it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, they had uh, spreading facilities, which means they've either got trucks running around in paddocks with differential GPS to prove where the fertilizer went. Uh, they've got branches or stores where the product is held, which is all throughout New Zealand. Um, you know, they've got planes and helicopters. Um, I'm not sure about Alistair's company, but I know ours. We certainly had... Um, uh, edges in Australia. We we bought a couple of companies over there, um, and that's a huge country, all the way even over in Perth, so very, very far from where we were. Um, so yeah, these organizations were um, yeah very spread out, lots of edge, lots of tech um, to prove where things went, health and safety, um, those sorts of things. Um, and yeah, I mean, back then it was a matter of getting whatever it was, whatever edge device or, or solution into the IT office, we would install things on it and, and configure it up and then send it out the door, uh, which was obviously very time consuming. Um, but then the other challenges that we were really facing back then was connectivity. I mean, 4G and 5G certainly didn't exist. Um, satellite internet was very expensive and very, very slow um, and, and potentially not even fit for purpose. Uh, fiber certainly wasn't rolled out. So all these sort of things made it very difficult, but also limited kind of the scope of what we could do, uh, could do out there. And then I guess you fast forward to today and things are, I'm not going to say completely different, but, you know, the, the connectivity is there. We've got more options for that, but also sensors are smarter, they're lower power, they're doing more, but equally we're capturing more data on the edge. So that's that's kind of I guess what we're sort of talking about here today, and I'm sure Alistair's got sort of similar stories of um, things. I mean, what sort of things were you dealing with back then, Alistair? So going back probably 20 years for me, I was uh, more looking at new technology that we could, could implement for uh, the, the local fertilizer company here. And so they had some really cool technology. Right? They had front-end loaders that had um, strain gauges in them to identify how much fertilizer was being loaded at a time. And so they could very very closely track how much fertilizer was being loaded. But then it became a paper process. And so I was involved in a, in a project to put some sort of computer on those front end loaders with connectivity and a user interface on it, and those kinds of things. And this is something that we were doing 20 years ago uh, with very rudimentary tech that probably wasn't really ready for it, wasn't quite fit for the purpose it was doing. And we had the luxury of being actually in the manufacturing facility, which had fairly strong Wi-Fi. And so we didn't have so much challenge of that, that um, last mile hop. But things have definitely moved on. I think you're right in terms of a, one of the big enablers here in New Zealand for the adoption of Agritech is that uh, the successive governments have continued to support an, an, an effort to bring high-speed broadband to everybody living in the country, at least 90 odd percent of people living in the country. So fiber if you're in a metro area and wireless if you're out in somewhere rural. 
And that I think has been really transformative for our agri-tech industry. And it's also driven by the government's ideas that generating more knowledge, working in a more high-tech way is really important for New Zealand's success. And again, successive governments have, have carried on with that. And I think, Stephen, your experience of the sort of adoption, your, your view of the adoption of tech within the agriculture industry in the US is a little different from New Zealand's. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I uh, I don't live in Silicon Valley. I live in the heartland. I live in Ohio, which is a big agricultural uh, uh, state. Um, we actually have uh, some pretty large farms around here and a lot of technology. Um, also, a lot of not technology, too. There's a lot of Amish in Ohio. Uh, offline conversation unrelated to this. But um, it's interesting, you know, in, in the U.S., the government has not been as aggressively pushing forward uh, connectivity, especially in this area. I mean, there certainly are initiatives here to connect schools and um, businesses. But in terms of uh, wireless technology, especially, it's really left up to um, uh, the industry. Now, I know that the government has been trying to encourage uh, better and better uh, wireless connectivity, 4G and 5G connectivity. Um, the government has also, uh, you know, here is, is very closely controlling um, spectrum uh, auctions and forcing companies to deploy uh, or, you know, encouraging slash forcing companies to deploy better coverage. But it's really, really not great. Um, again, Ohio is not quite as vast as, uh, you know, Kansas or something like that. But even here, uh, where we have pretty good 5G coverage, uh, once you get out into the fields, there's very, very little. And it's, it's very challenging here. Um, I, I was just hearing a story on the news uh, the other day about uh, the fact that less than half of American farmers have implemented any kind of agriculture technology, precision ag, ag tech. Uh, and, and it mainly comes down to two factors. Uh, one is the um, availability of uh, connectivity. And the second is the age of these farmers, since a lot of American farmers are getting older and aren't all that interested in technology. So uh, it sounds like a very different situation, even though you know we're talking about uh, very similar sectors. And also the thing that gets me is we're talking about an area where technology can have a huge impact. They were saying that, you know, crop yields, they're talking double digit percentage improvements, sometimes, you know, even, even, you know, factors of two kind of performance in terms of um, the benefits of this technology. And yet it's not widely used here. Yeah, interesting, you, you said. So, I know New Zealand is highly regulated in terms of, especially from an environmental standpoint. Um, every other day, there's a news story about, you know, farmers putting something they shouldn't in a river and now dogs can't swim in it or whatever it is. Is that the same over there? Because I suppose that presents a whole set of new challenges. All of a sudden, we've got devices having to capture data around where a product is going or being sprayed on a field or whatever it might be versus, say, telemetry going back in real time or near real time. So. What does the environmental thing, do you know about that over there? Do you have the same kind of requirements from a farmer to be able to record what went on where and with how, what level of detail? I, I don't know about the specific requirements on farmers, but I know that the U.S. Um, generally, in Ohio specifically, has become a very um, focused on this issue. Uh, one factor is uh, we have one of the Great Lakes here, and agricultural runoff is causing all sorts of problems with algae blooms. And so they're trying to get a handle on this. Also, you may know of the US EPA and the Clean Water Act. Well, all that actually came from right over there, the Cuyahoga River that caught on fire 12 times in the 1960s and was a cover story in the newspapers. That's um, why we have the uh, environmental reg regulations we have. But that being said, um, according to the things that I've seen, um, it's not quite like that where the farmers have to record and report. I think they're encouraging them to be more careful with uh, fertilizer, but I don't know that it's actually working. Right. Yeah. It's quite, quite different to hear. Like we have to prove with very good accuracy. So, so much so that I know that this was back then. So it's probably moved on since then too. The spreading trucks um, were quite clever. They knew the the fertilizer that was in the, in the bin had a, basically goes through a little, auger and then it's kind of got this thing that spins around on the back and it fires the fertilizer left and right out the back of the truck 
and depending on the settings there so we had a computer inside the cab that was recording the speed of the fan what product was being spread and it had differential gps on the truck so it knew where it was driving in the paddock with very high level like sub meter i think or sub half meter accuracy um and it knew what product was going on and therefore based on the fan speed how far the um, product was going left and right of the vehicle and then we were dragging all this data back in and uh, we had a, a company um, create a mapping software for us so we could see exactly where it drew a uh, drove in the paddock and then sort of outside of that you could see exactly where the product went so at any point in time if they were ever audited or the i guess the farmer wanted to check up to make sure the spreading was actually done um, in an accurate way they could go and see on that map and we had all those those public records well those records for the farmer or against their farm um, which also then serves um, a historic record too if i guess as farms move on or change hands um, you can see exactly what went on when um, which is yeah a, a big part of the the legal requirements of running farm here in, in sprays is is um, you know has, has very similar regulations i'm just not 100 percent sure of them yeah, and one of the other things that's happened over the, the time period in, in between our early experience and the current day is the proliferation of sensors around farms as well. And so a lot of the farms will have water flow sensors, temperature sensors, ground um, moisture sensors in all of the paddocks in, in order to measure the, the conditions for growth. Because essentially, if you're growing a cow, you first have to grow grass. And so even the um, agriculture is really a horticulture business. And so all of the instrumentation for that has, has really taken off over the last few years with um, radio systems like LoRa or um, uh, Sigfox um, allowing very low power sensor devices, potentially solar powered, uh, to be, be sending a lot of information back. And so a, a single farm has definitely become the sort of um, sensor network and, and edge environment that we think of for a larger organization. But of course, the single farm doesn't want to manage all of this. They want to have somebody else, and in, in, in Ben's example, the fertilizer company, holding and, and running the platform for this. So in some ways, it's, it's that, that each of these edge locations is a client to a more central, usually cloud location. And that seems to be a pattern we see quite often in the edge of this small repeatable unit that then does something locally, but sends data back for further analysis. Uh, that, of course, assumes that we've got connectivity, as we've discussed. But it also means that there's a need for automation of that deployment. And I think, Ben, one of the big things that we've seen change is that move towards platforms and automation alongside the improvements in the connectivity. Yeah, t totally. I mean, I was really excited uh, at Edge Field Day early this year when we had people like Avasa talking about, you know, shipping. Well, they obviously don't do the hardware side of things, but being able to orchestrate these edges when they get deployed. So you've got people, say, like scale computing, be able to ship hardware or stacks of hardware directly to site. So it's not having to come back to that central IT office. We're not having to configure things um, there before it goes out. It can go out there, comes online, assuming it's got connectivity, then an automation or an orchestration platform can go, hang on, well, I know who you are. I know what persona you are. I know where you are in the world, whatever it might be, whatever you've tagged that device with. And then it can push down that software stack that you've defined centrally and hold centrally which is great for deployment, obviously, um, speeds things up. We're not shipping things around the country. It's obviously got an environmental benefit too, depending on what you're shipping around. But also for that ongoing maintenance, you know, I, I look back to where we were, we would have to send people um, out to site to upgrade these once a year or twice a year or whatever cadence these things were on. So having that connectivity in place and that automation in place, the platform to do so, means that all those updates, all that maintenance can be controlled centrally. So all of a sudden we can update our software packages uh, centrally and, and have them push out, which means we can probably do updates more often, which is more beneficial to the, to the organization rather than going, well, it takes us a week and $10,000 every time we update this edge, which probably means you're not going to do it every month, are you? Um, so, yeah, I think orchestration is key to this whole thing, um, being able to control these edges um, in an automated way. Certainly when you get scale, sure, if you've got one or two edges and they're not too far away from you, then yeah, maybe it's not worth investing completely in orchestration or going the whole hog. I, d I definitely believe there's a level of orchestration that every organization should achieve. Um, but yeah, once you get to that scale or once you get that remoteness, so things are a helicopter flight away and on, on an island or whatever it might be, um, or you've got thousands of them or hundreds of them, then orchestration really is, um, yeah, 
not a it's a it's a need not a um yeah not something you can kind of just go oh well we'll, we'll sort it out later i believe yeah and that ship things to site and have them auto configure seems to be a very consistent theme through a bunch of vendors we saw it um see it with node weaver we see it with um hive cell and with Zadida as a, another presenter. So uh, yeah, that really is a consistent element of deploying out to thousands of sites. Yeah, Z Zadida is a, a good one too, especially, I mean, um, their device, like uh, obviously for edge stack scale is really good for things like in offices or branches or stores or whatever that might be. But those Zadida devices, because they've got such an array of them, and I don't know how you felt about it, when they started presenting them, I was like, oh my God, these are the sorts of devices, these hardened devices we were trying to stick in trucks on the end of loaders like you say um under the bench somewhere and or, or even in the fertilizer store um and i'm sure you come across this fertilizer is incredibly corrosive so just having a normal pc in there with a fan that's dragging through all the fertilizer dust they would literally corrode within a month if you hadn't had them formally coated so these hardened devices that can deal with these harsh conditions um, and then you've got things like on planes and helicopters and trucks and being, you know, sh shaken around um, everywhere. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Zadita's devices and their range of devices that they're able to, to ship directly to site and, and have that orchestration platform kind of um, available um, for or to be accessible anyway by their APIs, I think is fantastic. Yeah, it, it is really interesting to... To, to kind of hit on this, almost every episode we hit on this, when it comes to edge, the differentiator is not the technology, it's the use case, it's the scale. Um, you know, Ben, what you just said about um, remoteness, about the number of nodes, about uh, intermittent connectivity and unreliable uh, bandwidth, these are the things that we've been hitting on all season long. And it's really amazing to think that there is much connection at all between I don't know, a quick serve restaurant and an oil rig and a farm, but there is, and it's the same, it's the same thing as that, that we keep hitting that the, you reach a point where these factors conspire against you and you simply cannot manage things on a one-off basis. Everything has to be completely integrated, automated, zero touch, it's just amazing. And that, I think, is the, 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 the essential characteristic of the edge. And it gets to this whole question of orchestration. So this is something I think that, that we could talk about for a long time. But, but tell us a little bit more. Um, what is your definition of orchestration and how do you know it when you see it? Yeah, I mean, my definition of orchestration is really just automating in a repeatable way, um, like, a deployment of some description or, or changing, modifying something at the other end uh, in an automated, repeatable way, which obviously has a number of up, upsides and benefits. You know, uh, we know the stack's the same. We know what version it's running. Um, we can, it's more secure. We, you know, if someone can't accidentally forget to tick the enable TPM or whatever it is. So being able to orchestrate that, um, yeah, I, I think that means that, uh, well, Let's reverse that. I think good deployments will show, like good maturity within IT departments, a well orchestrated environment will just mean that the IT department actually has more time on their hands to actually deal with not firefighting in these little deployments and actually deal with the work and project and enhancing things and moving other things forward in their organization, if that makes sense. I mean, also, I don't know, what do, you, what do you think around kind of orchestration? Like, what would be a good example if you walked into a company right now and said, show me your stack, what would you know about them and, and uh, how would you feel? So for me, one of the key things is, is that the, that stack maps back to business requirements and business value. This is, this is where orchestration for me is about getting away from, um, the, I don't know, to use AWS's term, the undifferentiated heavy lifting, doing the hard thing. Right? You, you make the hard thing easy to do and you can focus on something that's not just this, this daily grind. And so I think it's beyond simply saying we can automate a build, we can de deploy out an application, but more that we can satisfy the business requirements so that we can get the agility, the ability to innovate that's required for business. And you know, some businesses are more innovative than others. Uh, but not being the department of no, 
um, the department that says, no, we can't do that. It's going to take us too long being the, the people who become an enabler for the business. And that does require that we get away from uh, updating BIOS manually on every machine or updating operating systems, that we can treat our sites, our locations as a population and deal with them as a population and say, everything should be at this configuration. So declarative configurations and uh, dealing with policy-based management as well, rather than having to look at every individual item and say, did this work? Did this not work? You look at a policy and say, are we compliant? Are we non-compliant? Whether it's a backup policy, a security policy, a policy that drives the version of application that's deployed at which sites, um, a policy that defines whether the, a particular site is, uh, needs to be compliant with maybe German um, data privacy regulations. Uh, having the ability to see that as a set of policies and say, well, are all of our environments compliant with all of our local geographically relevant and globally relevant security policies? These are the kinds of things that, to me, indicate a good, well-orchestrated environment. Yeah, certainly makes it easy. Like, IT teams are already stretched, right? They're already trying to do more and more. And like I say, as with the proliferation of more tech, it only gets worse. And without having to scale those IT teams, then orchestration really takes that heavy lifting out of um, the organization, which which benefits everyone. Like you say, you don't want to be the department of no, um, but we've all been there when someone's just gone, hey, I need this thing next week. And you're like, well, I've got 300 laptops to roll out. Like when, when am I going to find time to do this? And there's a hard deadline on that. So yeah, I think you're right. A well orchestrated environment just makes IT departments or organizations just more efficient. It takes that, that automated repeatable work out of, uh, sorry, that, that that work that just needs to be repeated over and over and over again out of the organization, which lets them focus on more important things. Uh, yeah, was my sort of opinion on it. What do you reckon, Stephen? Yeah, that that's another interesting point too. Um, you know, in terms of defining the edge, another f factor that has come up again and again is what you just said, which is unlike the data center where there is where IT exists, you know, there there are people who care about this for the its own sake. At the edge, there isn't. It's 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 simply another tool. It's a utility, a resource that needs to be running in order to make the real work happen. And there aren't people who need to care about this stuff or want to care about this stuff. And I think again, that's another factor that we need to keep in mind, and, and another reason that we need to have good automation and orchestration. Um, it seems interesting too that a lot of the technologies that are enabling this type of orchestration come from the cloud, because there again, um, you know, we have remote devices that we can't really be hands-on with, and so we need to figure out ways of deploying software in a repeatable and structured fashion, and we need to have automation. So, um, you know, we got to do it. Let's talk about Kubernetes on tractors. Um, how, how does this? How does the, the cloud and cloud technology work here? You know, I'm not even like come back to that Kubernetes thing. Like, it doesn't even need to be Kubernetes, right? Like, I think um, it was Avasa who actually, I think, said they actually moved away from Kubernetes just because they actually couldn't get that cluster to do what they want. And I mean, you know, I'm all for Kubernetes, and I and I love the engine, I love the orchestration ability, and you know, the the scale that you can reach for these things. But it's certainly not the answer for everything. And you know, we've been automating and orchestrating things for a very long time. I think the tooling, like you say, has got better, and they're now cloud delivered services and SaaS platforms which I think has a benefit. It's an, yet another platform um, that organizations don't need to run and manage. You know, rewind 15, 20 years ago, these platforms didn't exist. So you would go and find a vendor to, to buy this software that maybe did this level of orchestration and you would install it and run it on premise and present it to the internet and someone managed all the firewalls and the security and things around it. But being able to buy something off the shelf now um, if your organization will allow it, has massive benefits. Um, and it also has that resiliency because um, if it's in a cloud, hopefully that SaaS provider has, you know, got their services delivering in a, in a high available fashion across multiple regions um, or for performance purposes. You know, they might be at that global scale where you might have operations in Europe and the US and down here in little old New Zealand. And having, um, you know, even the software delivered to um, out in CDNs at those locations and making sure that that platforms up means that you can rely on all those edge sites being orchestrated without you know having to worry about so a single point of failure say back at your head office or wherever your own data center um, where this engine might be um, you know installed so I think 
yeah, the cloud has a big part to pay in making sure that these edges are also resilient and can be orchestrated and monitored um, is a big part of it. But I think there is a huge differentiation between having a control plane in the cloud and using cloud technologies out at your edge location. That, as um, you alluded to, that Kubernetes is awesome, but it may not be the solution for your edge problems because of the amount of infrastructure that's needed to run that Kubernetes cluster. And so although we use a lot of cloud-like technologies at the edge, there's also a huge amount of limitations at the edge that just aren't present in the cloud. You treat the cloud as a near infinite pool of resource and just draw out what you want. or well, You have a very, very finite amount of resource at your edge location. And so although we're using a lot of the same tools and techniques, there is that difference in, in architecture. And I think uh, we're seeing lots of vendors coming in with tools that help us manage that difference in architecture and not have to get too caught up in the, the weeds of the details, let them manage the details of the, that limitation at site. And all of the vendors we've talked to have, have had that idea of providing some level of abstraction from the underlying hardware. Yeah, that, that was one of the key things. I mean, I'm, I'm glad, Ben, that you brought that up about Davasa, for example, because we had that whole conversation with them. Uh, yeah, I think the idea would be that, um, you know, Kubernetes is, a, is is more of a tightly coupled control plane and that it needs, it wants to to be able to continually contact the nodes, uh, which is one reason that sometimes that technology isn't used at the edge. And if it is, it's used differently. Um, you know, as we talked with Brian Chambers about the way that they're using uh, uh, Kubernetes in their uh, quick serve restaurants, um, it, it's more about specifying system resources and packaging and deploying applications, uh, not so much about the cloudy things that we do, like load balancing and scaling. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of that dynamic stuff just isn't as relevant. Um, uh, maybe we need, instead of a, um, a navigator uh, metaphor, we need a tractor driver metaphor to come up with some alternative way of... Uh, uh, deploying containerized applications and managing containerized applications instead of that, it, it, that's, you know, sort of <laughs> the captain is in charge kind of attitude of Kubernetes instead of, uh, as opposed to uh, more of a swarm uh, approach. Um, oh, if only there was a company that had a product that managed containers in a swarm. I don't know, know if that existed. You know, the, uh, the, the metaphor to use will be a cattle dog um, because it's under, under remote command from the shepherd. Uh, and, and it's marshalling these sheep that uh, are a little unruly and uh, that you want to deal with as a flock rather than as individuals. So there we go. We're, what's Greek for cattle dog? <laughs> I'm looking that up right now. I'm looking that up. <laughs> I reckon we will. I'm, I'm sure it probably already exists. I bet you like John Deere or some really big agricultural machinery provider has already got Kubernetes of some form in a tractor. And even though it might not be presented that way. I imagine the way that they can get that repeatability and the software running in the tractor or harvester or whatever it might be. I wouldn't mind betting there's already a, yeah, a big piece of machinery that's running Kubernetes out there. I'd love to know about it. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty neat. I mean, even, you know, like I look at what we're even receiving in the data center these days around pure storage arrays and things, all of their underlying software, we don't have, we can't get to the Kubernetes cluster that's running in it, but there's a Kubernetes cluster running and it's running their, you know, their stack, their monitoring, their, all their bits runs now on a Kubernetes cluster within the array itself. Um, but we don't have to present a Kubernetes cluster to run our array, if that makes sense. So I have no doubt that it's there. Um, it's just not a, it's not, you know, it's not the only option out there. And I think uh, Vasa really hit that on the head and, and even some of the other organizations around just installing um, like Scale had a really good demo around, yes, they, de they deployed from template. Like that was cool. Like like what most people are probably doing today, deploying from some form of OBF type build or mounting an ISO and then having a scripted build run out with some of the other orchestration tools, you know, Ansible's and, and other bits like that. So, yeah, I think it's, you just need to work out what's fit for purpose. Um, we don't need to kind of, just put Kubernetes in or all these really big advanced tool sets in just because we want a little bit of orchestration. If we only need to spin up one or two things and we don't need to have it on multiple nodes, then what's the point in putting Kubernetes in? Like you could, if you still want that container like experience, you could just orchestrate even like a Docker compose file or something. Yeah. Um, if you want to abstract that hardware and then if it can be installed on a computer, then why not just use something like Ansible to get that piece of software on there? 
And so I think, yeah, having the ability to balance out what you need, but being able to centrally control that. So probably a good mark for choosing an orchestration tool or tools would be something that can drive multiple products rather than just, well, we only deploy to Kubernetes clusters at the edge. Probably not going to be a good fit unless all of your edges happen to look the same and you're running a three node stack or a two node stack or whatever it might be out on that edge. So something with a bit of flexibility would be something to look out for in a platform. And increasingly, we shouldn't be caring what's inside that platform, whether it is Kubernetes that the platform uses. This is to the point of, of the, the tractor or whatever machinery with a Kubernetes cluster inside. We shouldn't care uh, as the, the user of, of that platform and maybe care about the containers that are being shipped out, the application code, uh, but spend less time caring about the infrastructure that's used to deliver it. That's, I think, one of the really big things about this platform's move in, uh, in edge platforms. Yeah, absolutely. And that that gets back to that whole concept of, of it's not about NUX, it's about ducks, disposable units of compute. Um, you know, basically, yeah. it's the computer isn't the important thing. The uh, the important thing is is what you're doing with it and, 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 and keeping that in mind, too. It's it's, you know, kind of that pets versus cattle uh, argument, except taken to an extreme. Definitely. I mean, even like the security thing that like you look at um, the data does it they were talked about security a lot, like to the point that you can configure every USB port and, you know, mount this out and change all of these things and the underlying encryption at the operating system layer, so many data written to it because we can't take it for granted that, A, this thing's not going to get stolen or crushed by another loader or put between some hydraulic rams somewhere by accident or whatever. So the security of these devices are, are critical. So being able to configure that remotely too and make sure that those things are locked down and, and compliant, I think, LSD, you hit on, that compliance standpoint, certainly if your organization has any form of um, standard that they're trying to achieve um, quality or otherwise that may have some security or, um, uh, you know, aspect to it, then being able to prove to an auditor that you're compliant and the only way we deploy something down to these edges is with this piece of tool and it's got the steps in place to make sure that all of these security you know, policies are applied in an appropriate manner, um, I think has, has huge benefits. Um, because otherwise you're going to have to make sure that you've got manual processes in place for, you know, an IT rep or someone to log into these devices on, you know, regular basis and record that, yes, it is still off or on or whatever it might be. Um, so I think uh, that's definitely, um, definitely a huge one. Certainly having recently gone through the ISO certification um, here in New Zealand for our organisation, that record keeping, that ability to orchestrate and uh, prove that something is set or otherwise uh, is a really big, big part of um, what forms the controls for our certification. So as we're getting to the end here, um, I think that it's 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 been a fascinating discussion because we can see the parallels between, or the surprising parallels between uh, tractors and fertilizers and, and cows and um, factories and 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 restaurants. Um, Al, uh, what's your prognosis here? How can uh, the, the the world of agriculture technology and the demands of, of that edge inform the rest of the edge? Well, I think we've come to the conclusion that the world needs a sheepdog and that your edge location needs something that's going to control the uh, running applications across the plethora of edge locations that you'll have. So pervasive connect connectivity, good orchestration, these things are absolutely vital for us. And we really want these platforms to disappear under our application to, and to not be our problem, which is bringing in some of that cloudiness. Uh, of course, if we're talking about tractors, right to repair, you've got to own it yourself and be able to control it, but you really don't want to have to. You want it to operate for itself. Yeah, I mean, I mirror all those, those things, that connectivity and the orchestration is a must. Um, I think probably what the agricultural sector and, and probably some other very similarly aligned sectors would have to teach the rest is not all edges have to look the same. And I think the agricultural industry is a really good example of that, where we might have a branch store with some normal, normal compute in it with, you know, Windows or Linux servers running in them. But then we might have, like you say, a Raspberry Pi type powered device that's running whatever on it that's got a crazy sensor attached to the end of something. Uh, or something in a plane or a helicopter um, in these harsh environments. So being able to, um, yeah, 
support a number of types of devices depending on the use case rather than saying well our company's got these two edges we can deploy so if it doesn't fit in the loader or the helicopter then we can't do it um, and then on top of that making sure that your orchestration engine um, can support those different types of devices i think um, really kind of closes the loop on all of that and then really the world's your oyster at that point because all of a sudden we can deploy normal things and we can deploy really weird little cool things which i think is where all the cool stuff is it's the temperature sensor off the, the thing and we can start collecting that data back um, and, and doing really neat kind of predictive analysis or maintenance tasks and things on them. And I think that's where we're going to see more sensors going on more devices um, over time. Uh, and yeah, ag agriculture is high tech. Um, as much as it looks like some farmers driving around a paddock, digging up things and putting things in the ground, there is a lot of technology that surrounds this industry and they've got a lot to teach the rest of the world um, and a lot of other industries about um, how to run things, what to capture and what can be done. Yeah, I think that's been uh, very, very evident from all the uh, different verticals that we've talked about, uh, you know, from media and entertainment. Oh, it's just about the actors and the directors and stuff. No, there's a lot of technology um, and, and the demands that the technology puts uh, on us and also the things that are enabled by new sensors, uh, batteries, solar, uh, all of these things that we've got, cloud technology. It really is fascinating. Um, well, thank you so much for this conversation. Before we go, uh, Ben, where can we connect with you and continue this conversation? Yeah, you can uh, find me on Twitter, X, Twitter, X, one of them, whatever. I think both work, uh, at Ben Young NZ, uh, or you, my blog at benyoung.blog. So yeah, reach out anytime. Always happen to have a chat about anything, anything really, mountain bikes, tech, you name it, food, smoking meat, you name it. And you can find me, Alistair Cook, as at Demitas NZ. Uh, again, demitas.co.nz uh, is my local blog site. And you'll find me out and about with the V Brown Bag crew and the occasional Tech Field Day event as well. And it uh, should be easy to find me. You can find me on Google so long as you don't find that cricketer guy. So put something, uh, my name, and something technology related. And as for me, you'll find me here uh, on Utilizing Tech, also on our uh, weekly uh, on-premise IT podcast and our weekly Gestalt IT Rundown Tech News Show. So thanks for joining us for Utilizing Edge, part of the Utilizing Tech podcast series. If you enjoyed the discussion, do give us a subscription. You'll find us in your favorite podcast applications. You can also find us on YouTube at YouTube slash Gestalt IT video. This podcast is brought to you by GestaltIT.com, your home for IT coverage from across the enterprise. For show notes and more episodes, though, head over to our dedicated website, utilizingtech.com, or find us on Twitter and Mastodon at Utilizing Tech. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we will see you next week.